Uh, we actually we got this as a, as a suggestion. If I could speak English uh, from one of our listeners, Drayden, um, that NASA put out a TTRPG adventure, and I was like, well, why are we being so vague about that? Why are we saying tabletop role playing game adventure? Like, why aren't we saying like? 5e pathfinder whatever you built it for it's because mm-hmm. they didn't build it for any of those things yeah. it is meant to be as system agnostic as possible and just to set the scene a little bit more in the discord drayden was saying that and i was like what nasa has has <laughs> produced a ttrpg because the last time i dealt with something like this and i know this was this has kind of been a vogue thing in a lot of product marketing for for the last couple of years but the last time i dealt with this was uh maybe like 2019 when wendy's put out uh the wendy's ttrpg and uh, i've recorded a couple of episodes of of running that with some with some people and it was i mean it was ridiculous it was it was being run on uh, the most 5e uh, 5e kind of thing like they didn't really deviate anything they just changed a couple names um, and you know you had to uh, it, at the end of every particular arc in it it was always touting like you know the crispiness of Wendy's fries or something like that or the spicy chicken sandwich all the spells were related to menu items and everything so that's what I was predisposed to expect from this uh, and having said that I think the Wendy's people did a really good job with what they were told to do. It was comically entertaining. And I would have preferred to have a whole fast food multiverse of tabletop <laughs> games, like the Hardee's, the Hardee's game, the McDonald's, like McDonald's, like just as an aside, you really missed out because you've got the entire sort of McDonald land IP from the seventies and eighties that you guys could mess with. There's like, there's a lot there. Like you, you know, you stole it from Sid and Marty Croft, so you might as well make some money off of it. <laughs> but look, I- look, what Brandon's trying to say is McDonald's, if you want us to write you a branded adventure, you just need to let us know and we can talk pricing. Okay. All right. Reach out. Yeah. I don't think they will since I just brought up <laughs> them stealing McDonald land from Sid and Marty Croft again. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so Drayden's like, Hey, NASA put out this TTRPG. You should take a look at it. I took a look at it and it's, there's, charming is is a word that i will use to describe this whole thing it's it's kind of it's kind of hilariously charming i think it's clearly built to be kind of an educational resource the sort Mm -hmm. of thing that you would put down in front of a like field trip and be like this is what we're going to do for the next two hours Mm -hmm. um and so there's little bits and pieces that are science related or nasa history related or talking about like how the Hubble telescope was built. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's a fairly cut and dry high fantasy adventure on kind of an unusual setting, which I think that was the thing that excited me the most. Yeah. On the, on the lost universe website, um, which is, you know, Lost Universe is the name of this particular adventure on their website, which of course is hosted on science.nasa.gov. Uh, it's, uh, it says, it's time to gather your party and your favorite tabletop role playing game system. So there you go. It's system neutral. Play it with whatever you want. Uh, a dark mystery is settled over the city of Aldastron on the rogue planet of Exlaris. Researchers dedicated to studying the cosmos have disappeared, and the Hubble Space Telescope has vanished from Earth's timeline. Only an ambitious crew of adventurers can uncover what was lost. Are you up to the challenge? This adventure is designed for a party of 4 to 7, level 7 to 10 characters, and is easily adaptable to your preferred tabletop role-playing game system. I will say 4 to 7 players at level 7 to 10 will walk through this adventure yeah they will not they will not feel like they are being pressured or challenged at almost any point they Mm -hmm. will feel like they're having a good time i think Mm -hmm. but they definitely won't be like oh man we almost went down there i don't think this was written for any sort of hardcore combat oriented gamers no no (laughs) again i think this was written for somebody being on a field trip to a space museum and being like, oh, hell yeah, now we're going to do this for a little while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that 
the setting being on a rogue planet I thought was particularly exciting because for folks that are not familiar with astronomy terms, a rogue planet is a planet that is broken loose from its solar system. And in the case of this particular rogue planet, it broke loose from its solar system because its entire solar system was shattered by a black hole appearing in a nearby solar system. Mm -hmm. And so their whole solar system breaks apart and flies away, which uh, they refer to historically in a way that I think we as a people would also do as the breaking. Uh Uh-huh. But Josh, (laughs) but Josh, if a planet breaks away from its star and just goes off into deep space, surely it's going to freeze to death without the warmth of its sun. Well, yes, that would be accurate. Also, there's no light, so things become pretty difficult for people there. (laughs) But thankfully, this planet has magic. And that magic is uh, influenced by what the people on the planet refer to as the vacuum, but which uh, you will find as you go through the adventure and you learn a little bit more about space science. Uh, and anybody who's planning on playing this adventure as opposed to running this adventure, close your ears for a couple seconds here. Mm-hmm. It's dark matter. Dark matter is what makes their magic work. Is it dark matter or dark energy? I think it's... Oh, you might be right. It might be dark energy. Gosh dang it. Well, there's a helpful pie chart at the at the back of the book that explains the composition of the universe. And it's like 5% is invisible matter. Like 15% is dark matter. And then the remaining like 80 or 80% is uh, dark energy. Yeah, I think I think it I think you're right. I think it's dark energy. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's uh, that's so- in case anybody wants to nitpick our sci- uh, our science of magic on this. <laughs> So they use the magic from the the vacuum mm-hmm. and that magic allows them to put a shield around the planet so that they don't get wiped out by just some random space debris that they happen to encounter, such as meteors, asteroids, etc. Mm-hmm. And then they additionally use that magic to create uh, solar energy on the planet itself so that they can continue to have things like plant life. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I think is maybe a bit of a, a scientific, well, now hold on a minute, uh-huh. is they, they talk about how they've made it so that there are areas of the planet where the sun never sets because of this magic. Mm-hmm. And those are the most productive sections because the crops are so healthy and so fruitful and the sun's just constantly getting those plants to grow. Plants, I realize these could be magic plants because this is a world of magic. Plants generally like to have a break from having the sun beaming on them because the sun is very hot and has a lot of radiation that's part of it. Mm -hmm. And we don't do very well when we're in the sun constantly for more than a few hours. Plants do better than we do but they still have their upper limits. Maybe it's a special kind of magic sunlight that doesn't have radiation. I mean, light is light is radiation before somebody (laughs) says that to me, but you know what I mean? I mean, the kind of like Hulk inducing radiation. Yeah. No gamma rays in there. Yeah. Uh, So I, that was the one thing that of the science, as I was reading things, I was like, wait a minute, hold on that doesn't make sense to me. And then I was just like, eh, magic plants. And I kept moving. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you really, it took you too long to move on there. Uh, You you really just need to (laughs) suspend disbelief a lot quicker uh, based on what you just narrated to me to arrive at that point and then say, now here's where I had to stop for a minute and really question (laughs) the authenticity of this. I, Look, it took me out of the science-based nature of mm-hmm. most of what's going on in this yeah. adventure, okay? I, when I was reading this, and I, I, I mean this uh, to to dovetail with sort of the, the charming description that I used earlier. As I was reading this, my immediate thoughts went to the uh, Martin Landau, Barbara Bain series, Space 1999, from like the late 70s this is something craig could probably uh 
could probably fact check me on because I'm sure he knows what I'm talking about. And I would I will even ask Craig how long uh, until how long after we started talking about the particulars of this did it take for Space 1999 to pop up in your head a ro- a rogue planet of some sort just barreling through space having adventures that doesn't make any scientific sense. <laughs> this episode dedicated to Craig. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah you know you have to as as with any good science fiction story except for like a hard sci-fi story uh so all all you clarks and asimovs you get out of here but as with any sci-fi or fantasy story uh they they just sort of establish the parameters of the world right there at the beginning it's like look here's how it is deal with it let's move on (laughs) So the only reason I bring that up is because there's a lot of science in the entirety of the adventure, and I appreciate how much science there is in the entirety of the adventure. Mm -hmm. I also appreciated how accurate a lot of that science is portrayed. And so when I came to something that for me feels scientifically inaccurate, I was like, wait a minute, hold on. Uh And then I, as I do with these things, I went, that's a plot hole and I'm going to fill it with magic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we're moving on moving on uh, so the something that i noticed as we were digging into the adventure is that this reads very much like someone who does not do a lot of tabletop rpg adventure writing as their like daily activity mm-hmm. there's stuff The one that really got me was there's a puzzle where you're supposed to walk through one of two archways based on some information you were given earlier in the adventure. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll mention this without spoiling it so that players don't have to plug their ears again. Basically the correct solution lets you pass freely. The incorrect solution deals you one D six fire damage and then shunts you back into the place you were before. And I'm like, why does it shunt you back? What what reason does it have to mm-hmm. shunt you back? Especially when you're talking about two adjacent archways, they could both lead to the same place, y'all. This doesn't have to be... Uh, it. When you go, oh, not only do you take fire damage, but you get pushed back into the room, Like that raises the adversarial nature of that encounter significantly Mm -hmm. and i think people who spend a lot of time adventure writing and running those adventures know that and they go all right there's two paths they both go to the same place but one of them's gonna hurt you and it'll have a cost and one of them will not and will be fine and you'll have a great time getting there and i think so that initially i was like huh this this adventure has a few hiccups in it that don't suggest to me full-time ttrpg content creator Mm -hmm. it could also be well it could also be just having to level set the writing for the intended audience which let's face it is children well i i'd argue then that having both paths lead to the same place is a better solution Mm -hmm. because uh children at tables that i have run when you tell them they can't do something are determined to figure out why and how to subvert it because clearly there's a secret back there Mm -hmm. they're gonna boundary break the whole thing they want to boundary break the whole thing so if you go both paths go to the same place you take fire damage in one and you don't in the other Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they're like oh well i'm not incentivized to boundary break then i'm just gonna keep moving forward yeah was i i didn't read that puzzle was there any indication that through like scientific method or deduction or something like that that lets the party sort of figure out which is the correct archway yes okay there is and it's it's got to do with uh stars oh okay if you know if you know a little bit about how stars are composed and how they burn and things like that then you would be able to solve the puzzle very quickly with knowledge you have as a person oh okay um, oh and, and that's punishment Oh, we'll come back to it. 1d6 yeah. fire damage. Yeah. So it's not it's not a big like, oh, oh, you're really getting them with this. Like, yeah. You're if you're level 7 to 10, 1d6 fire damage is like, oh, 
Well, that was mildly annoying. Mm-hmm. Moving on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I want to, you, you said something and that reminded me of something I wanted to call out. You said, oh, well, like if you as a human, if, as a person know sort of star composition and things like that, then you're going to be able to solve this puzzle. And I know immediately some people are like, oh, well, that's like not really fair because that's like metagaming. Well, this, metagaming. this adventure is designed for metagaming, basically, because the whole premise of it is sort of this Stargate quantum leap kind of situation where your character's are on earth when the, like and the hubble disappears not just from orbit but apparently from its entire timeline which wisely the uh adventure just sort of hand waves as like time is complicated you know like wibbly wobbly timey wimey <laughs> kind of thing like retro causality etc um and so you all get transported to this planet but you're inhabiting the bodies of natives of this planet so that's how you get to keep all your Earth science knowledge while you're on this magic planet that also, to be fair to them, uh, has a tremendous bent toward scientific, science and academics. Yeah. Well, and I also kind of like that when we're talking about TTRPG adventures that you can use to introduce a party to the concept of role-playing games, making it so that you don't have to role-play if you don't want to is kind of nice mm -hmm. because then people can literally just behave as themselves at the table and not feel weird about it. Yeah. I was, I, I had never seen a more irritated group of people than one time when I ran uh, our um, rainy day adventure uh, where, you know, people create a character, they show up to play. Cause normally we play pickup games for, for people who don't know, we like run pickup games for strangers a lot of the time. And They'll have a character, they'll bring it, they'll be ready to go. I'm like, okay, actually, what you're doing is you're playing as a small child in a suburban house pretending to be this character. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like a double blind on them. Uh, and this is I, the exact opposite of that. Yeah, some people love the concept of that adventure, and some people are like, well, no, because I'm a really powerful orc barbarian. Yeah. And it's like... Yes, Timmy does believe that he is a very powerful orc barbarian. Yes. He is he is in it. <laughs> yeah. Um This is why you have a session zero in in actual <laughs> regular games you have with people. Yes. Yes, it is. So um the adventure overall, I think, is pretty well formulated. It's nothing too terribly complex, but you wouldn't want it to be too terribly complex. The science that's in it's pretty cool and is explained in a way that makes sense in universe, but also makes it a little bit easier to recall. Mm -hmm. And then they've also got some like some fun NASA history facts. Um, they've got some information about the Hubble telescope up to and including a um, one of those like blown out diagrams where you can see all the individual components. Mm -hmm. And the the whole adventure is basically you arrive on this planet and you find out that they've been studying Earth to learn about how deep space works since they're hurtling through it. And they thought that the Hubble telescope was really cool. And they think that either they goofed something because they don't fully understand their magic or someone was being malicious. And that's why the Hubble was removed from our timeline. Mm -hmm. And so it's up to you all. They are conscious of the Hubble and the fact that it's been removed. So it's up to you all and your adventuring party to figure out where it went and get it put back and rescue some research scientists that they had looking into the Hubble telescope that have also gone missing. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's got a lot of good resources throughout that sometimes I find myself wanting more of in more polished books. Like it's got guides for role-playing particular NPCs. It's got really solid backstories for some of these NPCs just to give you all the information you need to be able to, to play this with a group. Essentially it's just, it's not leaving you wanting for, for much of anything in terms of that, because like, let's face it, like that can be some of the, like the hardest stuff, especially if you're not an experienced GM It's just like, ha like keeping all the character backstories in your heads and, and their motivations and all that stuff. So it's really nice that they provide you with, with that kind of resource in here to really sort of bootstrap you. Cause again, intended audience is children. So while like probably it's very likely that 
parents or adults will be running this for a group of children like it's but you could have like a 11 12 year old or something like that probably comfortably running this i think i think so too i also i something i used to do a lot more of was scripting for my npcs mm -hmm. like oh the party arrives in this room and here are the sorts of things the npc is going to say and i i stopped doing that because well first of all my gms weren't using those scripts nine times out of ten mm -hmm. and then on top of that i was spending all of this time writing it and then sometimes it didn't even apply at my table mm -hmm. the scripts that i had written so i was like what is the point of this like this isn't nearly i should be giving you a general vibe of the person the sorts of things they know and then how they might share that information or under what circumstances they might share that information and nothing else mm -hmm. and then when I was reading through this adventure, all of the scripted sections, I was like, oh, there's so many scripts, like jeepers, like there's so many scripts. And then as I was thinking about, oh, you know what? This is not for your Sunday night D&D group to run unless it's like for a gaff. Mm -hmm. This is for a classroom or a field trip or somebody like that to run as something kind of educational, but also literally everyone involved may have never run a ttrpg of any kind before mm -hmm. and under that circumstance having all of your npcs have scripts makes perfect sense perfect oh, absolutely sense. absolutely <laughs> it's for what it's designed for it's very well done yeah yeah i the a lot of the criticisms that i had had for the writing style were before i was really thinking i was primarily thinking about it as a ttrpg module first and then i started thinking of it as an educational resource and the more i leaned into oh right this is an educational resource the more the few criticisms i had vanished mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's fantastic i'm looking at the hubble diagram now like that's just cool stuff that i still to this day right? as a grown adult enjoy looking at uh it's 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 I, I used to be such a big space nerd when I was a kid. Um, I had tons of books. Like even now, I still I, I read a lot of that stuff. Like I have a great book um, called like Red Sun in Orbit that came out like 30, 30 years ago about the Russian space program. And it's a very svelte read. And I encourage anybody to take a look at it because it's just this fascinating look at the parallel side of the space race. Um, but this kind of stuff I love. I this was not written for me though. Like I enjoy that this exists, but I wouldn't enjoy playing it. And that's not a criticism of it itself. Like what I want, NASA, if you're listening to me, here's what, here's what I want. I want some sort of cool system neutral, uh, tabletop game that takes place, uh, on Mars, like the, maybe like 20 years after the first Mars colonists land or something like that, like some speculative fiction for something like that. I want a tabletop game that is set in a sort of blimp city in the upper atmosphere of Venus, uh, where the air pressure and heat are manageable for humans. And we just have to wear masks to get oxygen. I want, I want something that takes place like, sort of like 2001 style on the like the the galilean moons of jupiter use this to teach people about all those things like this is great and i love that we have this educational resource for the hubble telescope but if i had to level one criticism at this is that they did not tie it back into our solar system to teach people more about that like i don't know necessarily how i would have done that so i really don't have any room like complaining and I'm not complaining. I'm just observing. Like, I would have loved to have an adventure that's sort of set in our solar system that can help teach people about Mars, teach people about the colonization uh, possibilities for Venus, which actually are brighter than that of, of Mars, right? Uh, like, talk about Europa. Talk about Titan. Talk about um, the pluto Charon system. Things like that. I, I want to see that. Please give me that, NASA. <laughs> I mean, Starfinder 2E is coming soon. So, you know, yeah. it'll be... <laughs> yeah. NASA, a good system for that. NASA needs to make, like, a flavor book like you would find for, like, GURPS 4E, where it would just be just random <laughs> flavor books about all kinds of stuff. That would be pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. I think 
But to be completely honest, I think the reason you don't see that for something like this is that they wanted player characters to still be able to use magic Mm -hmm. and they still wanted magic to be part of what was going on Mm -hmm. and that's tough to do while also having it be set in our solar system yeah realistically basically i want a tabletop science role-playing game instead of a tabletop fantasy (laughs) role-playing game hey well speaking speaking of settings with no magic lauren when the the kickstarter for born from ice is finished and you've released that i need you to make this mars game for me (laughs) (laughs) because <laughs> you'll already have all this experience making a no magic setting born from martian ice <laughs> born from frozen co2 <laughs> but getting back to lost universe again um i i find it so funny and for for the video version i'm going to put this up on screen is uh because it's only a 44 page pdf and it's free obviously so you should you should absolutely download it and we'll have the link in the description but I think it's really funny how you go through all this and you have this very nice diagram with labels and measurements and all kinds of stuff on the Hubble telescope. And then the very next page is a very Tolkien-esque map of the planet uh, Aldestron that you find yourself on. So much to the point that it's using like the, the Lord of the Rings font on the map and everything. I just, the, the dichotomy there is just really funny to me. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's cool um and it's a it's a really simple map like it doesn't have a whole lot of detail but it's it's very charming and you can see like the bits on the map make appearances elsewhere in the book as little pieces of art and everything so it's it's really cool yeah so credit credit to adventure writer uh christina mitchell graphic designer michelle belleville and then there's i'm gonna run through them fairly quickly and i hope i don't mangle any of their names Development and editing by Kenneth Carpenter, Katie Caudry, Rob Garner, Carl Hill, Peter Jacobs, Jim Jelectic, Jim Jeletic, Esben Jepson, Paul Morris, Gage Taylor, Elizabeth Tammy, and Lauren Ward. Mm-hmm. Who, uh, at the very least, Christina Mitchell and Michelle Belleville are people who work at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center doing other things as their day-to-day. Yeah. So this is like... I don't know if this was purely a like marketing strategy kind of deal where they were like, Hey, let's, let's build something that's kind of fun and it'll make some news headlines, which huge success there. If that was the goal mm-hmm. or if it was, if it, they were more education focused and they were like, this will be something fun. And then it goes viral on them mm-hmm. <laughs> because TTRPG nerds will absolutely promote the heck out of anything they find to be delightful. Yeah. Yeah, and they have a uh, a fun little video <laughs> on on the uh, Lost Universe site as well, and I, I encourage anybody to take a look at it because it's just funny because it's got I've I've got it on screen for the video version right now, but it's got that Lord of the Rings font. Uh, it's got pictures, you know, video of, of like Hubble telescope in CGI, and then it's got a bunch of people sitting around playing. Uh, the official NASA tabletop game and everything. It just, it's, it's just an interesting mishmash of things. And I really, I really appreciate it just as, as a way to just sort of unify different, uh, different parts of nerddom. Uh, But it's, it's basically, it's a trailer video for, for this release, which I think is funny. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, But yeah, uh, I, I, like I said, this is not for me, but I really enjoy that it exists. And it's something that I think could be really fun to run for like some science enthusiast kids. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the sort of thing where if you have kids at home who are even like passingly interested in TTRPGs and you want them to learn a little bit more about space, you could run this for your kids at home. Mm-hmm. There's literally nothing stopping you. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually probably like a really good homeschool resource too. For, I would think so. Yeah, for something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks, thanks NASA for putting some effort into this and releasing it because I think it's cool. And I actually hope you do more of these. Like I said, I threw out some ideas there. You know, feel free to give me a call. Uh, happy to <laughs> happy to talk through that a little bit more. Uh, but I hope to see more of these and, um, you know, I like, I would love to see, uh, the, like the national, um, like the national museum, like the Smithsonian do stuff like this for like paleontology, for archeology span 
uh, anthropology, things oh. like that. That could be really fun. Do like, do like an aerospace kind of like history of flight sort of adventure. Yeah. There's a lot of cool things you could do. Well, I'll tell you the Smithsonian actually recently had did some weird licensing stuff. Like on my pinball machine back here, I have four tables and uh, uh, I have four tables from the Smithsonian on there because it's a digital machine. So I just have a bunch of tables on there and like uh, they partnered with the Smithsonian at games partnered with the Smithsonian to create these digital pinball tables. Like the, you know, they never existed as real pinball tables. They're only digital, but there's one for like the natural history museum. There's one for the air and space museum. Um, and there's a couple, there's a couple of others and they're, they're fun. They're fun. They're a little overdone, but that's because I tend not to like purely digital pinball machines. Like I like I like playing ones that could have existed in the real world and these couldn't because of some of the stuff that goes on on them. But anyway, <laughs> they're really interesting. I have not learned a thing from them, but they're really fun. And I would look like since the Smithsonian it seems to be very like willing to do stuff like that, I would love to see them do something like a TTRPG. That would be really cool. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up for us uh, today. Josh, tell the people what they need to know. They need to know that if they want to support the podcast, they can do that either by going to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Goblins Growlers, or by telephone telegraph telling a friend about the Goblins Growlers podcast, because spreading the knowledge of things like the Lost Universe ttrpg <laughs> and the fact that it's actually very delightful uh is something that you can rely on us to do for you mm -hmm. so that you don't have to read an entire 44 page adventure to determine whether or not you're going to run it for your kids yeah absolutely um <laughs> and i would say also uh if you happen to be watching this on youtube subscribe to the youtube channel we're so close to uh, having a nice round number of subscribers and it would it's a small number but it would make me very happy um Beyond that, uh, there's the monthly newsletter that has cool stuff like gaming news. It has indie game suggestions, and it just sort of has a podcast recap on it as well if you just can't give the time, which is fine. Um, and then uh, listen to Quid Pro Roll, a narrative play podcast that uh, we're on in various capacities. We have a lot of fun with that. Um, I'm a over-the-hill cowboy hat-wearing wrestler. Josh is an edgelord thief in that. And we... And we frequently introduce random NPCs that have uh, altogether too complicated backstories and the most ridiculous voices and mannerisms. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's it. Other than to say, uh, we will be at uh, Triad Anime Con in Winston-Salem on the 29th, 30th, and 31st of March. I think that that's sounds correct. I think that's right. We will be doing uh, panels and performances, and we'll also have a booth set up probably in the merch hall, the merch and autograph hall, because that's what it was last year. Uh, so if you are at all familiar with us, come by and say hi and just make us feel good about ourselves because uh, somebody knew who we were. And that's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> we love to see your smiling faces mm -hmm. and it makes us feel important to know that people in other states are conscious of our lives. Yep. And uh, <laughs> just one last call out for the Born From Ice Kickstarter, uh, Lauren Small. Uh, help him help him reach his goal on that because I, th I think it's a cool project. I have absolutely no stake in it other than I did back it at, at the, the $95 level to get the three books. Uh, but other than that, I have absolutely no connection to it other than it's the game that I've been wanting to be released for a long time. So if you don't want to help Lauren, you can help me. You can do me a favor <laughs> and back help, them. Help Brandon help Lauren. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but thanks, everybody. We will catch you again in a couple weeks. And we'll by then, we'll have figured out what we want to talk about. We've got some ideas. So we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah. Bye, y'all.